Hi, my name is Bianca Sanchez and I'm from Creek Connections and today we're going to talk about what is intersectionality. First, we're going to define intersectionality. Intersectionality is a way of thinking about power, privilege, and oppression. It takes into account a person's combination of social identities rather than considering each of them separately. Some of these identities can include gender, race or ethnicity, class, your sexuality, religion, and more. So let's take a look of the short video of see how intersectionality is a part of our everyday lives. Intersectionality. Have you heard this word before? Even if you have, you might not know what it means. Let's take a look at it. The first part's easy enough. Intersection, a place where things come together. Intersectionality refers to the reality that we all have multiple identities that intersect to make us who we are. It also gives us a way to talk about oppressions and privileges that overlap and reinforce each other. This term dates back to the 1980s and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. She noticed that we didn't have an effective way to talk about how the experiences of black women are different from the experiences of black men and of white women. How? Black women endure both gender discrimination and racial discrimination. Over the last 30 years, scholars, educators, and activists have expanded the use of the word intersectionality to talk about identities beyond race and gender. Let's look at a few examples. Jerry has a disability, and his family lives below the poverty line. He is the oldest of 10, which requires him to do a lot of caregiving, and sometimes keeps him out of school. No one in the school counseling office has talked to Jerry or his parents about his plans for after graduation. He has applied for several jobs, but never gets called back. Fatima is Muslim and recently came to the United States from Somalia. She finds that many people at her school make assumptions about her values and abilities before they speak to her. Many of her classmates think she shouldn't be at their school at all. Greta comes from an affluent family. Both her parents and grandparents went to college and her father owns a successful business. She doesn't think about her identity very often, but she does think of herself as someone who will go to college and get a good job once she graduates. Think about Greta's situation as opposed to Fatima's or Jerry's. Fatima and Jerry are members of marginalized groups. They don't get to choose whether or not to think about their identities. Greta, on the other hand, can ignore intersectionality if she wants to. Life isn't the same for everyone even for people who share identity characteristics. By adopting an intersectional lens, we have a better opportunity to understand why and to change the institutions that help and harm us based on who we are. Okay, now we're going to take a look at cultural perspectives. This is Mae Jemison. She's the first woman of color to go to space. Mae always wanted to be a scientist, but she recognized the struggles it took for her to become a scientist. You see, May is a clear example of intersectionality. Typically, women of color are, tend to be underrepresented in higher academic institutions and especially in the STEM fields. STEM fields mean science, math, and engineering. One clear example of intersectionality is the treatment of many Black women in their uh, careers. Many of these women experience gender and or racial discrimination, or sometimes both at the same time. Now we're going to talk about the history of intersectionality, starting with Turtle Island. During the 1500s, indigenous Native Americans had many different sorts of conservation practices. They took care of the land because they believed that humans belonged to the land with the land. Until colonization started and then changes in land practices led. Let's take a look at this map, for example. This map shows the native land loss from 1776 to 1930. Changes in land practices and in ownership led to environmental degradation because Native Americans understood the best ways to preserve and take care of our land. Next came the late 1800s. This is where we really start to see how people of color were left out of the picture. In the late 1800s, black stories founding environmentalism and they were silenced and sometimes even stolen. In the late 1800s, industrialization became very popular, but also dangerous to human health. Industries polluted the environment from dumping toxins due to lack of regulations. 
During the 1900s, agricultural workers started to see new technologies such as pesticides, which are chemicals used to keep bugs off of plant crops. The use of DDT, which is an artificial pesticide, was used on farm workers back then, and they experienced horrible working conditions. In the top right, you can see a picture where farm workers were actually being sprayed with DDT because there was a lack of knowledge of how dangerous DDT was to humans. Lastly, we're going to talk about the idea of redlining. This is when property owners and realtors created zones so people could learn where they could and could not live. Property owners kept Black and Indigenous people of color out of safer neighborhoods that were unaffected by toxins. For example, Love Canal was a town and an elementary school built on a toxic chemical dump. Because of this, many people that lived in Love Canal faced many serious health impacts, such as cancers. This brings us to the late 1900s, a period of activism. This is when people of color tried to force their way into the picture. We started off with the Texas State University protest, which was a protest that students partake in to oppose the city garbage dump that was being built in their neighborhood. This led to the creation of environmental justice. Robert Bullard, the father of environmental justice. Some other key events that include that are about environmental justice that have happened more recently include the Keystone Extra Large Pipeline. This is a pipeline that is being proposed or happening up in the Western part of the United States that affects many indigenous communities. This pipeline affects Native American tribes by trying to drill for oil, which will contaminate their soil and water and displace them from their homes. The next is the Green New Deal, which was proposed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, attempted to prevent and address the issues of climate change caused by humans. The Green New Deal tried to help vulnerable communities that are disproportionately affected by climate change. Disproportionately affected means that the effects of climate change hurt these people more than other communities. Examples of this include Hurricane Katrina, Irma, Maria, Harvey, Sandy, and Dorian. Hurricane Maria, especially in Puerto Rico, affected lots of Puerto Rican people and caused them to lose many of their homes. Okay. Now that we've gotten the history out of the way, let's talk about the definition of intersectionality again. The formal definition is that intersectionality is the relationship between the many different ways that people are kept in a lower social position, controlled, or left out of important parts of society because of their differences. Some differences may include your religion, your ethnicity, your gender, your age, your sexuality, your disability or ability, your culture, and your class. Think of the different ways you have, you have experienced intersectionality or may have contributed to the idea. So why is intersectionality important to the environment? Well, mostly because it affects certain people differently, and this is a because of people's identities. Let's take a look at some examples. Disproportionate climate change impacts. Hurricane Katrina, Puerto Rico, Flint, Michigan. Again, disproportionate climate change impacts means that there are some people that are being impacted by climate change differently and unequally. People of color are affected more harshly by climate change than other people because they are located near coastal areas and can't afford to leave these areas. Another good example of this is Flint, Michigan, where people of color are lacking clean water, yet the government isn't doing much to help them, and these people can't afford to move away from their homes and communities. This happens because some people have different access to environmental resources. Resources like green infrastructure, which are like these nice green areas that are built in cities and towns to promote the idea of green energy and environmentalism. Also education. Education is an important environmental resource. It's the amount of in education you are receiving about the environment, such as environmental science at a younger age. And lastly, renewable energy. Renewable energy, such as water, wind, solar, which is the sun. These are all accessed differently by different people in the world. Because when people lack resources and education, the government will allow some bad things to happen to some people. For example, toxic waste facilities are primarily built or located in communities of colors. Plastics and landfills polluting the surrounding soil, water, and air, and all of these toxic waste facilities are very dangerous to human health. Exposure to harmful toxins from fossil fuels and toxic waste facilities and other industries, such as the agricultural industry and the plastic production industry, will all produce very devastating health impacts. Exposure can lead to harmful health impacts like cancer and asthma. This is why it's important to be aware of how environmental issues affect people across the world and across the identity spectrum. We have to take race, poverty, and all other elements into account. For instance, environmental racism describes how people of color and people with less money are more likely to live near sources of contamination and away from clean water, air, and soil. 
Let's go back a little bit to this idea of environmental justice. What does it mean? Well, according to Robert Bullard, environmental justice means having access to decisions being made and making sure that there's access and that no one segment of our city or county or region should be making decisions for other people. Let's hear what the Rhino has to say about how decision making affects different people when they are not included in the process. Five out of five city landfills were located in black neighborhoods, six out of eight incinerators were located in black neighborhoods, and three out of the four of privately owned landfills were located in black neighborhoods as well even though African-Americans only made up 25% of the population during that period of time. There's a lot of numbers. This pretty much means that even though African-American people barely made up the population, they were located near the worst types of toxic waste dumps because they didn't have a say in the decision-making processes that allowed these dumps to be located near them. If they had the choice, they wouldn't want to be located near waste. So think about what does intersectionality mean to you? Think of all the way your awesome identities intersect to create you and the experiences that you take part in. Here are some pretty cool resources on Instagram if you have it. Maybe some pretty cool accounts that you can follow. And then here are some cool books that you can read, some websites to check out, some podcasts, some videos on YouTube, some channels. And this is just the beginning of how intersectionality can be a universal educational standard. So think of all the ways that you intersect in life, and thanks for watching. To access the activities, you can access this from the Creek Connection Symposium website. The first activity that I have is the Identity Science Activity Link. The point of this interactive activity is to have students in comfortable, safe space to share aspects of their identity by moving around the room to the signs they relate most to. The teacher should ask engaging questions to prompt students to move and to have students reflect on their answers and the ways they differ from their fellow classmates. Some identity signs can include sexuality, gender, age, siblings, the quantity of siblings, your race, ethnicity, or national origin, social status, your class, and if students don't know this one, a good replacement could be if their parents went to college or not yes or no, citizenship status, culture, or disability. And lastly, the best part about these activities is debriefing with students so they can understand the purpose of the activities. Questions like, what identities do you think about most often? Or what identities do you think about least often? What identities would you like to learn more about? What identities have the strongest effect on how you perceive yourself? What identities have the greatest effect on how others perceive you? Or lastly, why is it important to critically reflect on our ident identities? The second activity, if you are not comfortable with the first one or if it's just not for you, is an environmental debate activity. The purposes of this activity is to educate students of the different impacts of climate change and the way they affect all kinds of people. It will also show students how governments work to create climate action plans and prioritize different mitigation me measures. Students will be presented with research on nine different countries' climate action plans. Using this information, students will formulate their own climate action plan and debate why their country's plan is the best option. For extra fun, you can provide students with a hypothetical climate disaster scenario, and they can assemble their climate action plan based on that. The first hypothetical climate disaster scenario is the severe hurricanes in the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean are causing coastal floods and massive amounts of damage to city infrastructure. How will your country respond to this? Hypothetical climate disaster scenario number two is that global temperatures have risen through over three degrees Celsius and forest fires are beginning to cause devastating impacts to agricultural fields and forests. Health impacts from smoke have started to contaminate cities. How will your country respond to this? Thanks for watching and please check out all the other amazing activities and resources on the Creek Connection Symposium website.